you've got specialty breeds, is that yeah. right, endangered breeds? Yep. That's correct. We picked the endangered breeds just due to the fact of their uh, hardiness. This breed originally comes from uh, Lincolnshire, uh, Lincolnshire, England, back when they were trying to commercialize the dual breed. Then having been in Afghanistan and watching how, you know, they have a very primitive way of agriculture. American mule foot hogs. Probably about 500 left registered in the country that are pure. We traveled everywhere for them. We like bringing our products to people that wouldn't otherwise be able to access it. Tell me a little bit about your future and what you're really wanting to do for your land. Okay, so you're Allie and you're Ryan. Yes, ma'am. And this is Radical Roots Farm, yes. right? Yes, in Sterling, okay. Connecticut. Okay, and you guys are doing something really cool. You've got a brand new property here that you're cleaning up but you've got specialty breeds? Is that yeah. right, endangered breeds? Yep. That's correct. Uh, so we picked the endangered breeds just due to the fact of their uh, hardiness. This is probably the furthest south that you want to see uh, the Lincolnshire Reds. Usually once it starts hitting above 65, they don't do so well. Is that the cattle? Yeah, so that's okay. the, the uh, maroon, like burgundy colored ones. Okay, yeah, let's go. I, I know they're in the exact opposite that yeah. we were just walking, <laughs> but let's go over that way and see them. Because I have, uh, so I have a really big cattle background. I've been with cattle my whole life. I don't know this breed. So I've never heard of this breed. This before. breed originally comes from uh, Lincolnshire, uh, Lincolnshire, England, back when they were trying to commercialize the dual breed cattle. The best way they started doing it is you have the uh, milking shorthorn in Europe. And then right. you'll mix it with um, a beef breed. Uh, I'll have to look back on their research on it to see which one they use. But right now, the way that it's supposed to work uh, is you're supposed to outpace the beef master, which is why we went oh. with them. Oh, hey, so beef master is one that anyone in the beef industry knows. Oh, right, are. right. I know beef master. So one of the not heifers, but cows we brought a couple years ago, she dressed out above 60% yield for wow. carcass yield. So, and she's a dual, and they're dual purpose. Yeah, they're dual purpose. Um, their udders do get pretty big which is why you can get calves pretty big, pretty fast, which okay. is why we went with them. And then we started bringing up, bringing in the um, Scottish Highland Coos to try to do a, uh, do another hybridization. Ooh, a little <laughs> tongue twister right there. I get you. The difference is it's like supposed to create that hybrid vigor. So you're taking two old line breeds from Europe and um, when you bring them together, you're supposed to get another vigor out of it. Um, and what happens is you're getting the forage ability. I mean, they. The Lincoln Red has a really good forage background on it. If you do put them on good grass, they'll perform even better. Just like the uh, Scottish Highland Coos. And then the Scottish Highland Coos have that, that really winter coat to them, which helps. And being here in Connecticut, you guys have some rough winters. We haven't in a couple of years, but years past, we've had pretty harsh winters. Like, okay. uh, was it two and a half years ago? It was like negative 20 and they were loving life. <laughs> uh, one of the people that we, we do a lot of business with that's in Alberta. Last year, the year before, it was down to negative 37. They were out in the field, just hanging out, eating hay and loving life. You've been doing this for a few years now. Uh, close to eight years now. Eight years, wow. Okay, so what really got you interested in these breeds? Like, are, is that breed, remind me of the breed's name again. So the Lincolnshire Reds. Lincolnshire well, Red. Well, you can, for sure, is Lincoln Red. Lincoln Red, okay. That's interesting because my son's name is Lincoln and he has red hair, so awesome. that will be really easy so you to, might have to get him. You might have to get him a Lincoln Red. <laughs> um, so what got you interested in that breed specifically? Like why? why? Um, the number one thing is, is it's durability. You don't have to do all the vaccines. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to do as much love and care. Okay. It's kind of like a set it and forget it kind of breed. You're pretty much there just to manage its grazing patterns and, you know, mineral intake. You know, it's not a very hands-on breed like you'd see like your black angus where you always having to handle them um, that's kind of why we went that way especially you know when we were seeing trends where it was going to be a lot harder to get vets out if you did, mm. did need to do vaccines and stuff like that vets out here are very like hard to come by yeah well even just their mothering ability um, i mean yeah. they They're... seem very low-key like your daughter's over there just petting on a cow just <laughs> loving on her yeah, like, they're like this all the time. They're <laughs> but you don't handle them very often, but they're no. very friendly. Yeah. They they have their own like family systems too. Like the the moms always stay with their young and then right. as the young get older, they still kind of like stick together. So uh, you'll see like mentality. multiple generations like from the same cow like just continue to stick with with their their family. Wow. And, um the lighter colored like this this guy um so the dark red ones are pure Lincoln reds. The lighter colored ones are crosses between the Lincoln Red and Highland. 
and then the white one is the British White Highland Cross. Okay. And her baby is this one right here. So you get some really cool coloring here. Yeah. When you start crossing them anyway. Yeah. And are, so you said that they're dual purpose. Are you using them for dual purpose or are you Not just using them for be beef? Just beef right now. Um, okay. we, we do have plans in the future to split the herd and okay. go in a milk direction. As of right now, we don't have the facilities or we're hoping in the future we'll have them to be able to split the herd. You know, the numbers we want to have is at least 200 and 200, so 400 total. How much acres um, do you have here? So we have 84 here. Uh, we're in the process of buying another property, which is 97 acres. And we're just continuing looking for more and more land. I mean, you can never have enough, you know, grazing ground. And you're basing this on, uh, like we talked off camera, on like a regenerative model. Yes. It seems like your grass is really short right now and you're rehabbing this property. Are you trying to do daily moves or how, how so is your what, grazing management so now? So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we do have some issues that we're dealing with right now with, you know, water issues. Uh, okay. We do have ponds that need to be dredged right now. It's just getting to get them dredged. Yeah. It's a costly maneuver. Yeah. No, I totally get that. Okay. So right now they're just open grazing or what are you doing? For all of last year, we, we rotationally grazed them. Okay. Um, this season, because of the water and like all the runoff and erosion and everything, we have kind of just let them just graze where they can, but they they just move themselves into the spot today. So <laughs> they like it in here. Our lamb ram. Oh yeah, the ram's in here. He <laughs> hangs out. He, for some reason, he hangs out with the cows and He's all the females well, are over there. So what happens? He's like my family. Yeah, so we're gonna get him shear, shorn tomorrow and all the rest of them. That's why we have the shoot down here. But what happens though is it, it seems like they've moved into like a fleared system. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Huh. It's um, Greg, Judy. Greg Judy. Yeah. Greg Judy, yeah. he does uh, fleared systems where you okay. put your sheep with your cattle and it helps with um, predators. I knew that model. I didn't know that's what the name was. Yeah, he calls it the fleared. The fleared system. Okay, okay, interesting. So you have a, you the know, flared. Oh, flared. Flared. There you go. Yeah. Okay. It's a flock at, and a herd together. A flock and a, I see. <laughs> no, I didn't know that's what he called them. Okay. So you keep your sheep with your Cattle. cows for the most part. Yeah. Okay. They actually, they started doing it themselves with the dogs and everything. And yeah, because yeah. we got dogs for predator control, whether it was two-legged or four-legged predators. Okay. <laughs> Ever since we've had the dogs, they kind of just like integrated themselves with, with the herd. And obviously that's a safer spot for them. So yeah. But you've been farming for eight years. You got cattle eight years ago. What made you want to start farming? Like, did you have a farming background? I know you said you're military. Yeah. So what was, what's your background like? What made you like want to come here and, and farm here? So the biggest thing that for me is always hearing the stories because my grandfather had his farm eventually taken by the state of Rhode Island due okay. to Emmett Domain for 146 realignment for that corridor. Uh, oh. It was about a 400 acre farm you know always hearing the stories and growing up you know i used to work on farms with my father because he was a diesel mechanic so farmers always need a diesel mechanic. yeah yes they do <laughs> so we'd always i'd always go with them because we are a decent sized family i mean i was I'm one of four kids you know dad would have to do odd and jobs mm -hmm. to make the bills work so we'd always go with them we'd always go on the farms and hang out and you know hang out with the farm kids and stuff so it was just always around it and then having been in afghanistan and watching how you know they have a very primitive way of agriculture i just seen it was a better way than what we were already doing here because sometimes the things that we did back in the day weren't necessarily bad what do you mean because if you look at a lot of the farm fields around here you'll see they have about f between a five and a ten acre field and it's all rocked off and that was all for rotational grazing but what happens is it's too labor intensive and we don't have a labor force up here anymore you know we have better ways to do it now you know with the advances of solar chargers and right. poly poly wire and everything like that you can pretty much have an open piece of land right. and set up your own grids and your own grazing patterns based on how the grass is rebounding back after you put cattle. Taking the old way and making it new. And you saw that in Afghanistan. Well, not with that aspect, but it was just the fact of them just mo doing daily moves with their, their flock of sheep or cattle. Like with the shepherd. Yeah. Yeah. So you're seeing like the biblical aspect of the shepherd and it's like, well, okay, well, why don't, why do we put everything in barns here? Right. You know, and I've been with Jordan Green and me and Jordan Green have had talks about how American commercial farming worked their way into that confinement. And it was, you know, you can, when you look back at it and you see how the evolution of it went, you know, from, okay, well, we're going to put the um, cattle underneath the house so we don't have to worry about heat. So it's like, okay, but the wife doesn't want to smell manure anymore. So you make a barn. 
And then what happens is once you put them in the barn, you start closing down your, your numbers on the barn to make the most profit you can. Yeah. But now you're at a point where you're making profit for that system. You can't go backwards if okay. the system doesn't work anymore. And that's where we're at. You wanted to take a step further with the endangered breeds. Yeah. Right? Okay. Well, because the thing is, is you, the breed had is, so if you look at the uh, Black Angus, Black Angus has a lot of originations from the Lincolnshire Reds. You know, that's a lot of bloodline was used to make them. But what I don't like about the Black Angus is you don't have a good birthing ability because yeah. they've narrowed down the pelvic you know, floor in there. So you gotta have to pull 90 pound calves. Who wants to pull calves? You know, when you can have one that's, that, you know, like I said before, I mean, we got a 60% yield on one of our Lincoln Reds that we sent. So it's like, if I can calve anywhere between a 60 and 90 pound calf and not have to pull it. Yeah. I mean, you're living the best of both worlds. Absolutely. You know, now what happens with the Lincoln Reds and the um, Scottish Highland Coos, we can graze them year round on grass. We don't have to feed them grain. Because what happens in the cattle industry, they've bred a lot of the cattle to perform on grain. Yeah. So if you put them in a grass-based system, they fall apart. You know, we're trying to take the old and bring it to the new. You did have larger herd sizes, oh, and due to point. some exterior circumstances, those numbers are down a little bit right now. But you're wanting it to be a full production model, so you're trying to sell it. You're trying to sell the meat product to consumers, right? We yes. actually have a great, um, a great following for our meat. The meal for hog we've... has the most delicious meat. Yeah, we've sold <laughs> as far away as California. Wow. Um, we ship across country. All of our meat's USDA inspected. We have people that come from other countries. Like we, we have a friend in Hong Kong that comes to the United States, and he custom orders all wow. of his meat from us because he can't the regular grocery store meat just upsets his stomach. He'll spend hundreds of dollars just to get it shipped over to wherever he's staying. That's awesome. So your presence is mostly online then? Um, we do a couple markets, um, but they're out of state. Where are they at? In Providence. Gotcha, so you're um, going down. Yeah, so we it's travel. It's about a 45 minute drive to the market. Yeah, we travel, but um, it's we like bringing our products to people that wouldn't otherwise be able to access it. We, we're SNAP authorized. We do a lot of like food stamps sales that kind of took off during the pandemic. We did monthly meat shares and um, different things to get our products to, to disable so, yeah, many, so many other, people. yeah, so many people that couldn't leave their homes. We worked with Connecticut Food Share and we donated like hundreds of pounds of meat to them so that they could distribute it to the food banks and everything. Yeah, we try I mean, to give back to the communities. Well, the thing too is, I mean, we didn't grow up having a lot of money as kids. Yeah. You know, growing up in Winsaka, Rhode Island, it's not a very uh, wealthy, you know, area. So, I mean, we did want to create a high density product that has high flavors that's chef quality. But once we get got the product to where it, we want it to be, you know, we started focusing well on the less fortunate. Because the people who are fortunate enough, I mean, they can afford the prices. So I mean, we that's why we did the meat boxes because it's a way to be able to balance out the prices to be able to keep it low. You know, you're not going to always get you know T-bone steaks and ribeyes and stuff like that. But you know, once in a while, you know, we'll be able to put those in there for our customers. So tell me more about these meat boxes. So you set up meat boxes for your customers? Yeah, well, my wife does, cause she's- So, <laughs> so she's, we do eight and 18 pound boxes. We kind of try to balance it out. So um, it's usually beef, pork, and chicken. We don't have chicken available year round, um, obviously, cause we seasonally raise it. But what's the best way? How would I explain it? So we, we focus on the whole animal. Um, every animal that we raise, we try to utilize as much as we can. We have a lot of people that buy the organ meats and stuff, just obviously because we're grass-fed and finished. So people come to us and they, they want the organ meats if they're going to eat organ meat. Um, but we do have customers that buy that stuff for their dogs. Mm. So we try to tailor our boxes um, to include stuff that people would typically find in the grocery store. Just like for versatility and just the maximum amount of people. But our boxes change every month, so they're not standardized. Every month you'll get something different that you didn't get the previous month. But everything is stuff that you typically find yeah, in the it, store. It's just yeah. pretty much she packs, because she's the one that cooks for us in the household. Uh. So what happens is she critiques the boxes to be based on, because we eat towards the weather pattern. Okay. So if you're going to, once we get to the winter months, you're going to start having more of your roast and your, you know, home cooked meal type of stuff. Yeah. In spring and summer, it's going to be, you know, a lot more chicken in the spring. Well, a lot more in the summer than you would in the spring. And the spring will have pork and beef more. Yeah. Just because the seasonality of the chicken. 
But I try, like, I'm not going to give somebody, like, a big roast to cook in the middle of the yeah. summer. Like, right. Like, you know, stuff that goes in the oven. Usually I try to do, um, when we send animals off to the butcher, we do, like, fajita meat in the summer. Mm. And, like, those kind of, like, open air, like, grilling cuts and sausages and all of that stuff. And then in the winter we do more of the roast. Like, some people, they, they want bones, so we'll double their, their poundage for bones. Like, say it's, like, five pounds, they want, like, they want ten pounds and we'll give them the 10 pounds, but we'll only count that for five pounds of their box. So it kind of like evens it out a little bit. Yeah. Um, we try to stay flexible, as flexible as we can. Some people have like- Dietary stuff based on religion. Oh yeah. It, their religious beliefs, obviously, but I don't know. I just, I try to I try to work with the customers as much as possible. That These are the people that are like feeding our family too, so. So Allie, what really then is your background? in all of this like it's one thing for your husband to be like that's what i want to do but you are really on board and you seem really passionate about your customers for one where's where's your background in all of this and what's your why here it's the family because like i want to give my kids a, a good life like they get to to live out and be free you know yeah. and i want them to eat good food yeah so that's really why we started from my perspective is because we didn't want to have to rely on the grocery store yeah. Um, and not knowing where our food comes from. We raised a couple animals in the backyard for ourselves and then it just kind of, we looked Exploded. at each other and we were like, the first time we tried the mule foot pork chops, we were like, more people need this. Yeah. So it just kind of took off from there and word of mouth and everything. And now we have a regular income from the farm. I left my job with Mass State Police to do this full time, so. Wow. So you both are on the farm full time now? I'm not yet. You're not yet. Okay. I will be shortly. Okay. Okay. So you're working that way. Yeah. That's yep. awesome. That's, that's the goal is to um, create a whole complete loop. Well, that's what the new property is for because it is a 97 acre property and five acres are already in, or in orchard production. Oh, wow. So what will happen is that we'll be able to close like our nutrient loop that we wanted. Because we originally wanted to be able to have our beef and pork and chicken side of the house, but we also wanted to have you know, organic apples and, mm. you know, peaches and pears and plums. Preferably no spray. Yeah. Right. But organic. So what will happen is you're going to have spoilage when you're dealing with fruits and, and stuff like that. So what will happen is to close the nutrient loop, you can feed apples back to the cows, you can feed them to the pigs and the chickens, and you can run the sheep through to be able to graze property grounds instead of using any equipment that's right. using um, petrol. So I mean, just and reducing- the ducks, the ducks for pest control for the orchards mm. itself. Like there's there's tons of snails, like I can't wait to run ducks through it, them See, to like provide the fertilizer for the plants and yeah. just kind of have it take care of itself. You said close the nutrient loop, and I haven't heard that before. I like how you said that. Well, cause that's really keen. I like that. Yeah. Well, cause the thing is, is, you know, a lot of farms, like, I mean, we're, we're prone to it as well, even though we're regenerative. I mean, we're not at, you know, there's a lot of people I inspire to be like, uh, there's a couple of farmers up in Maine that are doing 360 degree, 360 degree day grazing. Well, not degree, but days of grazing up in, in Northern Maine. So it piques my interest of, you know, being able to push the envelope to be able to not have to do what we call nutrient mining. So if I buy hay from someone else's farm, that's robbing nitrogen and, and other, you know, minerals from their property and it's bringing it here. So, mm. I mean, you know, one place is losing it and the other place is gaining it. So creating that nutrient loop, one property is never losing any nutrients. Yeah. It's all staying within the confines of the land. The ultimate goal is to be able to have that one big ecosystem, which is why we went towards, you know, the regenerative biodynamic systems where you're multi-stacking you know, livestock production. That way it's like, it's a step closer to that whole closed loop. Yeah. Yeah, because each type of animal kind of brings its own like- Manure profile. Manure yeah. and different controls the different pests. And it's like having an apple orchard that's just straight apples. It's like, you're gonna introduce like different funguses and uh, fungi and like bacteria and everything. Mm. And then your entire operation can be- Wiped out. Wiped out with right. just one thing. Bringing it full circle to talking about the closed nutrient loop um, and then the diversified breed. So I heard mm -hmm. you say mule foot. Is that the breed of pig that you guys have? Yeah, they're yes. American mule foot okay. hogs. Probably about 500 left registered in the country that are pure. Wow. Yeah, they're, we traveled everywhere for them. Yeah. We, where we, are they? Are we able to see them? Because I've never seen that breed before. Is it too far? Oh, uh, we can go up in the back. I'm sure they're up in the in the back lane down. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. I would love to see that. I so mean, the lineage behind them is that they're so the Spanish conquistadors were notorious for bringing their their Spanish hog all over the world. 
And what they would do is they'd always just leave them on islands everywhere. And when they came back, they'd come and slaughter them for food on the way back through. Okay. So by boat back then, it would take forever. So by the time you come back through, you know, they'd already be ready for slaughter. Yeah. So what happens is from the, the folklore is that when they came here, they traded in southern, southern states with the natives, um, the hogs. Okay. So that's where, you know, there was in that, that corn belt down in the south. It goes all the way out west. Yeah. I kind of want to just point this out real quick sure. while we're walking through it. So when we moved here, there were this property, like the grass was horrible. But like you can see where the cows have left their traces. Uh-huh. Because it's much higher. And the yeah. diversity. I want to point out that you, uh, the grass is very short right now. But you said this property was always oh, trashed when you bought yeah. it. So this and property, so you're really recovering. Yeah, because this property, this property hasn't, hadn't been touched for probably about 10 years. It was left fallow. Wow. So, I mean, where you have to do a lot of, you Have know, you been cutting, like, cutting this down? Was this all brush then? So there's a lot of brush in here. There's a lot of, what is it? We had a lot of uh, thistle in here. And mm -hmm. the cows actually, we, when, in the first year, we did a lot of high intensity grazing. So what that'll do is you're, you're forcing them down to the size of a sheet of plywood to eat from. So what happens is if there is thistle there, and they want to eat, they're going to be forced to eat it. You know, it's not bad for the cow, it's just they would rather eat, eat fescue. Else. So the thing is, we got to the point where they will eat a whole thistle down to the ground, you know, with the thorn and everything. Wow. Um, I didn't know that, that they would eat. I thought they just ate the flowers. No, they'll, we got they'll them to eat the, eat the whole, whole thing. thing down to the wow. ground. They're great, too. They graze off the trees. They, like, they do, like, they prune the tips of the trees and everything, yeah. keep everything in line. Even the weeds. What, why we picked what we did because yeah. it was just it just made the most sense. You know why why put something into your ecosystem you're building that's not going to work. But you can kind of see like all the issues with the water. It kind of oh, just found yeah. its own way to a. Uh, yeah, because there's like right where there's that, a pond back there. Yeah, there's a pond up there. And then you go up the hill. There's another pond. Oh wow. Um, okay. There's a lot of ponds on here. But it just kind of like washed everything out and. Yeah. Which in regenerative function, I mean, water security is you know, number two on top of, you know, soil conservation. Right. On camera, you guys are having a really hard time with some of your management practices that you want to because there are people around here that don't necessarily agree with what you're doing. You're trying to navigate that bridge walk, but it's not something that we can really expand upon. Yeah, at on this time. camera. Yeah, okay. Maybe in the future we can, we'll we can dive we'll, into yeah. some of that and do a little recap and, and see how maybe it plays out in the future. But that's why you're working on a regenerative model, but at the moment that's why your pigs are kind of scattered across, your cows are, but they are all within your, how many acres did you say? 80? 84. 84 acres. That's, I mean, And to put it into the perspective, lot. I mean, we, we had it all fenced in within the first year. Well, a year and a half, I mean, give or take. Okay. I'm not counting. <laughs> it, was a, it was a tall order to, to put it all in. Wow. The, back, the back side is, is oh, pretty wow. rocky. You fenced in all of it by yourself then? Uh, me and a couple other, of, of the close neighbors to the property. You know, they all volunteered their time. So these are the pigs? Yes. Awesome. So these are American mule foot? Yes, the American like, mule foot hog. Okay. And what is, other than like their Spanish history, is there like a yield? that people like out of them or so like the yield so the, the reason why the commercial industry never picked them up is they don't grow as fast as a burk so i mean for us i mean it's especially hog you know we're gonna go up to 18 months before butcher because we're gonna put them on acorns out in the back wow where all of our oak trees are so we're gonna kind of we, we try to follow the spanish model you know like they do in portugal mm. that, that's what makes the best cured hams okay is that that acorn feed that they get in there because all the tannins so these are it, and they look like a normal, just a regular dirt pig. Yeah, but what happens is they have, um, the one thing that's special about them, why they call them the mule foot, is they have a cloven hoof. Oh. So they don't have a split. So right. what happens is you don't have to worry so much about um, hoof rot when it comes to them. So you can see they have a solid hoof. There's no split. Wow. And they're quite friendly. Oh, oh yeah. They're very friendly. They're great. Is this two sows? A sow and a Two sows. Two sows. Okay. We have a little boar over here. Okay, I saw a the boar. one with the tag. So he's, he's already per he's already selected for somebody. And that little girl, we're gonna keep her back. And they're a little lanky, kind of like the. Um, so we raise mangalistas. So they kind of remind awesome. me of like yep. the long yeah. leggy mangies that we had. Yep. Yeah, we it actually we used to raise them too. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. We liked the mangies a lot. They were good. How do you how do you think that these ones compare to the mangies? Then, because you talked about the when you ate the first pork chop. 
And that's how I felt when we had our mangalistas because they were so yes. heavily marbled. Yes. yes. What do you feel like the difference is between the mangies and, and these um, ones? The mangies, feel... we get more of a woodland taste, more of like a earth versus, I feel like for ours, I mean, at least our, our raising practices, it's more of a sweeter taste. So it's like, it, it's all depends on, because like the, the mangoes are going to get more into the dirt than the right. mules. So they're going to so eat all So these ones the... don't, teal, don't till as much? Oh, they will. Oh, okay. But there has to be something. Like if there's a whole plethora of acorns, they'll till. Because they're going to want the acorns more than they do anything else. I think that for the taste profile for like for a pork, like you said, it, it probably is a little bit sweeter. The fat cap isn't as big either. Yeah. Oh, so okay. like it's it's a it's a better balance, I feel, like a meat to fat ratio than, than the mangas. Because okay. a lot of people, like they get scared off by fat. Yeah. If you grow these guys slow and you don't feed them too much for them to put on too much fat, mm. you, you still have to raise them for a long time. Like the mangalitsa, not as long mm. and you're not getting as much fat. Right. Like we love fat anyway, but, and we <laughs> yeah. try, we try to sell it to everybody because we're like, you need to like appreciate fat. You know? I agree. But, I would do that to my customers too. And we had them, I'd be like, you see that fat cap? You eat that. That's what you want. Yeah. Yep. You want <laughs> that. You don't need any sauce with these. You just take a piece of meat and mm -hmm. a piece of that fat and you put them together and it's amazing. Yep. <laughs> but, and it's funny cause it, it, you know, having fat, it brings me back to like when I was a kid, like my meme who's was from Canada, you know, they came from the farming countries out in, you know, the northern parts of Quebec they always like talked about missing having fat because you know I grew up in the area where you know our government told us that Crisco is the new thing and it was healthy mm -hmm. for you and fat was bad and yeah. caused cholesterol and you to die and now we look at it and it's like okay well that vegetable shortening wasn't good for us and now it's all well let's go back to fat yeah. and fat's actually brain food so yeah. yeah and especially for those up in a northern climate I mean, you need that for the winter. Yes, <laughs> like you do. You, you really need that to sustain yourself through the winter time. So. Well, even still, there's so many uses for the fat. Like people make soap. We have mm. we have soap makers come to us all the time for like bulk packages. I have like a whole freezer designated just to just to fat. <laughs> Let's talk about your goats while we're here. So, what breed of goat do you have? These are Nigerian dwarfs. They're just kind of here for fun. Okay. <laughs> for the, kids. the kids wanted them. They kind of just do their thing. They're not even really friendly either. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. They're just here. Do you butcher them? Don't. We're, we're looking at getting into because we have a lot of clients that are asking us heavily for goat. I fell in love and with goat. And there's really not not that many people that raise goat. And I feel like you're in an interesting spot where you can get into different cultures. Yeah. yeah. Around here, yes. that prefer goat over beef or. Yeah, and pork. I think especially because we we use the whole animal, we mm. bring in a lot of a lot of different cultures. We have people that come to us just for like heart, tongue. I'm sure it's a big one. We oh, have yeah. oh yeah, tongue. As soon as we get cheek, tongue, they want. oxtail, beef cheek. Got some things that I I don't even know how to cook. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. And um, I'm like, well, I've thing... had people ask for hooves, like cow ears. Hmm, um, ears. I haven't heard that one. Well, a new just... one that we have a new butcher that we're going to be working with. We're hoping to be able to get tripe with the stomach. It's uh, a specific part of the stomach, but a lot of Italians point. love it. It's a big delicacy, kind of like uh, cooking liver. Okay. You have to cook it just right because it will turn into shoe leather. So as we kind of finish up, tell me a little bit about your future and what you're really wanting to do for your land and, and with your animals and your business. Um, the number one thing is, is we're still my goal. I mean, I'm kind of gotten shifted off course from it but the goal is to have at least a minimum of a thousand acres um, across the states of either Mass, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Being in Connecticut is kind of on the teeter-totter just because of the politics. Um, okay. We're still going to go for that thousand acre move. We're going for 365 days is what our goal is to be able to um, graze year-round. Are you saying that you want a thousand acres to move your animals to or yeah. manage a thousand different farms? Or a nope. thousand acres worth of different farms. So what it's going to be is we're going to grow our herd to the point where, you know, we can supply the demand we have and be able to just move them to those parcels. That way we can have our hogs move to all the different acorn properties that we have so mm. we can do our, you know, acorn finished pork. Our whole plan is just to go big. I mean, we already have a great following. We already have great customers and, and farm family friends. And all we have to do is just go up and just keep providing that product to them. That's awesome. Well, guys, it was so, so great meeting you and get to know you and being out here on your property. This is definitely different from the farms that we've been in Massachusetts and Connecticut because it feels old time farming yeah. versus where we've been does not feel that way at all. <laughs> so it's, it's a nice little change of pace. I love what you guys are doing here. I love the different breeds you're using. Yeah. So cool. Thank you so much for having me out and, and showing me around. Thanks I appreciate for coming it. out.
Yeah. Thanks for coming out as well. This is one of those farms that like you can just feel their dreams and aspirations are just going places. I mean, wanting to acquire a thousand acres in different places. Honestly, it's, it's a great idea because I mean, you're not going to be able to just more than likely, you're not going to be able to just buy a thousand acres, right? Of, of one parcel. So being able to move your animals around, having the 360 rotation um, year round, I love it. I think it's awesome. And I especially love using the endangered breeds, breeds I never heard of before. I have heard of a lot of breeds and seeing the Lincoln Reds and the Mule Foot today, really, really cool. Thank you again for coming along with me on this tour. This is our last tour for Connecticut and we're heading to New York next. We're gonna be um, in upstate New York. We've already got a ton of farms scheduled. We're so excited to see them. We'll be in Vermont after that. So if you know of any farms in Vermont, North New Hampshire, over in that direction, let me know. We'd love to come and see them, shoot them a message. Until then, I will see you guys at the next tour.